Let's stand, folks. What a gorgeous day. Oh, what a miracle. A Roman cross you carried A borrowed tomb left empty Your spirit now within me Oh, what a miracle Oh, what a miracle Behold the Lamb of God Who takes away my sin Who died and rose again Hallelujah Behold the King of grace Who washed my guilt away And He overwhelmed the grave Hallelujah Now she cannot accuse me I stood before the jury And the judge was full of mercy Oh yeah and Oh what a miracle Oh what a miracle We hold the land Once I was dead, now I'm alive. Oh, what a miracle! So unbelievable. The way that you work in my life. Once I was dead, now I'm alive. And oh, what a miracle! So unbelievable. The way that you work in my life. Once I was dead, now I'm alive. And oh, what a miracle! So unbelievable. The way that you work in my life. Once I was dead, now I'm alive. Jesus, once we were dead, but now, because of you, we are alive, and we say amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Welcome to church. Welcome to Clondoff Beach Baptist Church. My name is Janelle, and if you're visiting with us, welcome. For those online at home in your jammies, with your cuppa, welcome. And um, I believe we have Pastor PJ doing our announcements. Thank you, Pastor PJ.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Yes, so we just only have a few announcements for this morning. Oh, just the usual before all the others. Uh, COVID reminders. We are always um, um, asked to remind everyone that we should sign in at the door and, of course, keep the usual social distancing requirements and other uh, COVID safety measures. Um, first announcement is that the Tucker Box, uh, you know, we used to bring the trailer out um, to the community. Uh, this is an amazing ministry where we can actually um, help out people who uh, are going through a difficult time uh, in their lives. And it's also a wonderful opportunity for the church to reach out and um, tangibly express the love of God and also be able to share uh, the good news with a lot of people. So the trailer is planning to go out again into the community, but we need volunteers. We need help to do this. So if you're interested in that, um, volunteers are needed once or twice a month, um, and uh, there are opportunities for food preparation, for driving the, um, for driving the car that will uh, pull the trailer, serving food, and, and or kitchen cleanup. So if you're interested in helping out in this wonderful ministry, um, you may contact Mary Frost or ask the office for more details. Um, and you, the ships are available for Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. So for now, those are the days. So if you're available on those days, um, I hope you would volunteer for this. Um, what else? Oh, home groups. Home groups. Um, the church is moving towards a new direction for, for the home groups. Now, personally, I believe small groups are crucial to the life of the church. You know, Jesus ministered to a lot of people, to a big group of people, but he also invested a lot of his time, more of his time even, with his 12, his 12 disciples. It was like his small group. So if you want to really, um, I, I believe if we want to really grow um, as being disciples of Jesus, it's, it's crucial that we have a group, a small group of people who we can gather with, who we could grow with. So if you're interested in joining a small group, or um, if you want to be a small group leader, a home group leader, I know some people are already leading their home groups, praise God for them. If you want to lead the home group as well, um, just let us know. Um, you may just approach me or Andrew, um, or you may call the office for more information. Um, but also, um, on, on the uh, July 4, we are hoping to have a, this is a tentative date. On July 4, um, a tentative date for um, new and existing home group leaders. If you want to be a home group leader, um, we'll, we'll meet July 4th after service. So probably just in the hub. So if you want, if you're interested in that, uh, let us know. And then we'll go, we're also going to be announcing um, if there are going to be groups going on, we're going to promote this more often, um, like when they're going to happen so that if someone wants to join, um, you're, you're, you're welcome to do that. Um, all right. What else? There will be no service tonight here at church because there is a combined chaplaincy service at the Red Cliff Uniting Church at 6 p.m. So again, no, no, no evening service. Uh, for those watching at home, no evening service um, at Clontarf this evening. Again, um, joint chaplaincy service at Red Cliff Uniting Church, 6 p.m. And I believe there's a request from the office to send in photos. They're updating the bulletin. Oh, not, not the bulletin. Um, I, I believe that's the prayer directory. Um, if you could, if you could uh, contact the office regarding photos, um, they'll give you more information. Um, and we have an online bulletin if you, have, if you don't know about it. There's a lot more detail and information in that. Um, if you're interested, again, um, you, you, you can be part of that electronic bulletin. Uh, just let the office know about it. All right. Um, the offering, we still don't pass around the baskets, but you can uh, use the box in the, backs, uh, uh, box in the back to, to put in your offering, or you can give online. Uh, let me just pray for, for all of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for today. It's a beautiful day again to, to worship together, um, both physically here and also with the people at home. Thank you that we, we have the chance as, as brothers and sisters to, uh, to, to unite and worship you, Lord Jesus. I pray that you speak to us once more today. Pray for those people who are struggling with, with things in their lives. Some people are sick. Some people need healing. I pray that you touch them with your healing hands, Lord Jesus. Uh, some people are struggling with finances, with circumstances in life. I pray that you be with them, Lord Jesus. Be close to them, especially during the difficult times, and help them to see your way 
um, how you would help them to, to move forward, Lord Jesus, and, and really be able to accomplish your good will for them. Um, I pray for the offering. Thank you for the privilege that we can give um, even uh, a small portion back to you, Lord Jesus, and participate in your work through the offering. I pray that you bless us and teach us how to use whatever is collected uh, for your glory and for us to be able to expand your kingdom. Uh, thank you so much for, really, for your blessing from day to day, Lord God. And we just want to give everything, our all, to you. Uh, teach us how to serve you. Uh, we commit ourselves to you, God, and thank you again for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children may go out to Children's Church. Thank you. Let's stand and keep worshipping our God this next song. It talks about how great the, the chasm or chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. It says it all, doesn't it? So let's stand and worship our God, the one true God, living hope. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through darkness, your loving kindness, tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living to be out of 
up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth he will not allow your foot to be moved he who keeps you will not slumber behold he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep the Lord is your keeper the Lord is your shade at your right hand the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. That's Psalm 121. Thank you.
to hear what you have to say to us this morning, and we pray that you would speak to our hearts. May we have ears that hear you. May we have hearts that are open to receive your word this morning, and we pray your anointing on Pastor Andrew as he brings the word. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. Sounds like it's going to be loud. Well, good morning to everyone in the room and good morning to everyone online as well. It's great to be with you as we come now to towards the end anyway of the book of Revelation. Things get exciting now. Uh, there is, well, I don't know how it is for you, but for me, I'm getting excited as we come to the end, although there's some pretty heavy stuff in here that's um, hard to digest. But that's okay. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the first 10 verses of Revelation chapter 20. And if you're unaware, you're about to find out, but these are perhaps the most disputed verses in all of the Bible. And so we will, I'm expecting, all be fighting by the time we leave this morning. Uh, but I'm happy for you to um, just simply agree with me. That would avoid all of the trouble. Uh, here we go, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read some passages and then I'm gonna read Revelation 21 to 10, it's not that long. But then I wanna read some other passages from the scriptures as well and when I come to them, I'm gonna ask you to stand. Um, the reason being, I read you know, the Nehemiah Ezra bits in the Old Testament the other day and when the law, the book of the law was discovered and it was read in public, everybody stood out of respect for the word of God. So I'm gonna let you sit for a bit of it uh, it's just so that we're not legalistic about it. And then I'm going to ask you to stand when I read the other passages. Is everyone got that clear? All right. 
All of this stuff as usual, you can follow along on the Bible app if you wish. Revelation 20, 1 to 10. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, in case you're not sure who he is, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for, you guessed it, a thousand years. You are understanding this, aren't you, that when you've been raised from the dead, you're not going to die anymore? So a thousand years is no problem. Just in case you're, you know, a bit like me, you're starting to feel a bit old and you think, what, a thousand years? Are you kidding? Barely making 50. Um, Here we go. Uh, Where am I up to here? Verse 6. Blessed are... Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they'll be priests of God and of Christ, and they'll reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. That's the bottomless pit and the big chain, and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. Remember them from the end of chapter 19. And they will be tormented day and night for a little bit longer than a thousand years forever and ever. Is that all clear? Piece of cake. All right, now I'm going to ask you to stand as I read some two passages from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And then Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit 
and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf, and the lion, and the fattened calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. Please be seated. Let's pray. Lord, may your word speak to us afresh. May we understand it, even though many have disputed these passages, I pray that it will be clear and that we will all understand. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said before, chapter 20 is one of the greatest causes of disagreement among Christians. It mentions that period of 1,000 years that's called the millennium, and I don't think I'm on the spectrum, although some would argue that I am, but it's got two worlds and two ends millennium. If I see it with one end, I get the heebie-jeebies. So there's a period of 1,000 years. Theologians have known it down through the centuries as the millennium. While the period is mentioned a lot, and hence I read from Isaiah this period of a glorious future, I believe is talking about the millennium, the actual words, the thousand years, are not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible other than here in Revelation chapter 20. And many Bible-believing Christians, many people who love God, read this chapter completely differently from each other. And so heated are the arguments sometimes that the details of the chapter get lost. And so I think it seems that Satan himself is behind some of the disagreements. You see, if you take the chapter at face value, you find that it contains some information that Satan certainly doesn't want everyone to know. He does not want you to know that he is going to be bound, that he's going to be then released and then thrown into a lake of fire forever. The end of Satan is certainly portrayed for us. And it is no coincidence that the book of Revelation and this chapter in particular and the first books, Genesis 1 to 11, are the most disputed books of the Bible. One describes Satan's role in the fall of the world and the other his judgment and his end. He doesn't want us to know. He doesn't want that stuff to be in our face. So he has these huge disputes, huge conflicts amongst Christians about what all of this is about. And so they never actually digest the information. He's the bad guy, he caused the fall, and his end is hell forever. And it's not just that. You see, this chapter speaks about the resurrection of the dead, of all people, the righteous to everlasting bliss, and those who don't know Christ to be in hell forever with him. He doesn't want you to know that. There is painted here a picture of a judgment seat and on it is not Satan, but it's Jesus. And those who don't know Christ are judged and sent to hell. We'll talk about that next week. 
I can understand why Satan doesn't want you to be thinking about these things. So he creates a controversy and the truths are often clouded. You know, it's been often, well, people have studied and they've observed that if you stop believing in hell, it won't be long until you stop believing in heaven. They say it takes about 20 years. You stop believing in hell, within 20 years, you'll stop believing in in heaven. These truths in this chapter are what make the Christian life, the Christian message urgent. I don't know how it sits with you, but we've just read stuff. People will be going to hell with Satan. Jesus will judge people. Jesus will reign on the earth. And if you take all of these truths out of the picture that we call Christianity, then it seems to lose much of its bite. You take away the need for us to be saved. As many people say, if you share Christ with them and offer him as their saviour, they go, saved from what? Well... How's about an eternity in hell with Satan? If you have not been scared by what we've looked at in the book of Revelation thus far, then this chapter should scare you somewhat. The only way out of this for yourself is to doubt that it's true. And the devil will help you with that. And I don't believe you can go, oh, phew, (laughs) I'm so glad that I know Jesus. I'm going to make it okay. I don't need to worry about any of this. You can't be like that either because there are loved ones, there are neighbours, there are workmates, there are people all over the world who are going to hell. And only a hard heart doesn't feel the burden of those who will be lost. It's the hardest part of the Christian life. Yeah, it is. Let me paint the picture so far, even though I know you're smart, I've just, I've, I've decided not to put the graphics because Marcus isn't here. Um, he's the one that wants them all the time. He's not here, so I'm not gonna put them up. I'm just gonna tell you. What we've had so far in the book of Revelation is a seven year period of tribulation on the earth. It's a period of unsurpassed terror in the history of the world. During that time, Satan empowered an evil individual called the Antichrist, and with the aid of an evil false prophet, they're going to rule the world and create a religion that is basically Satan worship. The center of their government will be in a city called Babylon, and at the end of the period, the beast or the Antichrist will gather the armies of the world to wage war against Christ. Christ will come and he will kill them with a word. And the city of Babylon will be destroyed, the beast and the false prophet thrown live into hell, and the only bad guy left is Satan, and he is dealt with here at the beginning of chapter 20. What I'm going to talk about is three significant things in this first part of the chapter. Satan's doom, the thousand years, the first resurrection, and the second death. We're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ, which is the rest of the chapter, the next time. So know that next week is all about the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be warm and fuzzy. Bring your friends. (laughs) Number one, Satan's doom. No need to be, uh, have any disagreements here. An angel tethers Satan to a chain, locks him up in the abyss for 1,000 years. There he is held, unable to influence humanity with his deceptions. 
Then mysteriously, at the end of the thousand years, he's given a little while set loose. Again, he sets about deceiving people and he succeeds to gather another army of people against God's people, but fire comes down from heaven and destroys them and then the end of Satan is spelled out. Let me read it in black and white just so that you know. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire oh, and sulfur where the beast, does anyone know what that smells like? Yeah, I'm, I'm going rotten eggs. You know, the rotten egg gas, that's sulfur. Yee-hoo. Fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. If you ever are finding yourself praying against the evil one, Don't be afraid to read Revelation 20.10 in your prayer. All right? The devil is a loser. Oh, he's bigger and more powerful than us. Yeah? But a loser. Doesn't hurt to let him know that. You got that? Uh, I want to talk about the little while that he gets set loose at the end of the thousand years in application at the end. All right? That's enough of that. Let's get on to the thousand years or the millennium. Two L's, two N's. Please. I'm looking at some school teachers going, what? Has it got two N's? Are you sure? Yes, I am. It's two N's, two L's. It's like resurrection, it's got three R's, right? Good. Oh, don't want to go there. Six times in this chapter, the same period of 1,000 years is mentioned. Six. How this 1,000 years is understood is the huge dividing issue among Bible-believing Christians about the end times and the second coming. In fact, I would make even more of a case that it actually divides them on a whole lot of issues, not just the second coming. There are three main options, and uh, of course, because we all just love to have our own opinions, there are variations that are huge even among these broad three options. And so I don't want to oversimplify things, but I'm going to present to you in general terms the the three options, and I'm going to do it in in order of unbelievability. So the one I don't think's right, I'm going to do first. The one I don't think's right, but maybe a bit better, second. And the one I think, number three, I'm going to do last. So you know what's going on. Are you interested in this? You're all going, nah, just tell us what it says, man. Now, you need to know this stuff because you're going to bump into people who think the other things. All right? Mild mannered Christians in other churches around the place are going to go, oh, I'm one of those. You still should get along with them fine. What I say, I've written down so you can read it so it's all clear. All right? The first, but most unbelievable, is post millennialism. This view takes the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth to be fulfilled through the church. And so it thinks that society, like where we live, is going to become progressively Christian and God's kingdom will slowly take over, so much so that for 1,000 years you can call the world and its political environment the kingdom of God. And at the end of or after or post the 1,000 years, Jesus will return to the earth as king. Now this view was popular after the enlightenment and the world was just starting to take off and everyone's thinking things are getting better and better and better. And then at, well, 
hundred odd years ago, there were two world wars, there's been moral decline, and it seems that this view that we're going to just slowly get better and better and better is just obviously not real. And what about the scriptures that describe an unprecedented period of tribulation like we've just been looking in the book of Revelation just before Christ comes? I don't believe this view is really worth tipping our hat at at all. You got that? All right, post-millennialism. Number two. Also, I don't think it's true, but a lot of people believe it. A, millennialism. Have I said two L's, two N's before? Just making sure. Now, this view holds that there'll be no literal reigning of Christ on the earth. A, millennium is to millennium like a theist is to theist. So, no God, atheist, a millennium, no millennium. There won't be a thousand years. So all the talk in the Bible about Jesus reigning on the earth is going to be uh, fulfilled by his reigning through the lives of believers now. There is no place for God to fulfill his promises to the Jews. They've been taken over by the church and will be fulfilled in a spiritual way here and now. These guys do have room for a tribulation period at the end of which Jesus will return and eternity will begin then and there. You're getting this? So all of the promises of the Old Testament are, if you like, spiritualized and fulfilled in the life of the Christians here and now. Now, I don't like this view because of how it reinterprets the Old Testament and makes the church take over from Israel in a way that the New Testament does not allow. I believe the church participates in the promises to Abraham, But nowhere is Israel said to be replaced by the church in God's programs, which this view says. Many of the Old Testament promises must be reinterpreted without justification. Otherwise, there needs to be, we need to be seeing a fulfillment of them. Like, will there be a period where the lion and the lamb are lying together? that we read about before. I think I take the Bible seriously. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Why? Because the Bible is true. Next, premillennialism. This is the last and third one. This is me. And most of you without you knowing it. This is the view that Jesus is going to return to the earth after the seven years, just like it says in the book of Revelation. He will reign on the earth, and during that time, the promises seen in the Old Testament will be fulfilled in this thousand years, called the millennium. It comes from a straightforward reading of Revelation chapter 20. This period of earthly rule by Christ will be characterized by world peace. There'll be no armies. Swords will be beaten into plowshares. There'll be peace among the animals. Lions and lambs will lay down together. Little kids will be able to play with snakes. Although I, for one, wouldn't be happy with my kids. Don't take your parenting cues from those passages in Isaiah. There's going to be justice, there'll be no more poor or oppressed people, there will be prosperity and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. God will be seen to keep his promises and that's why I read some of those stuff earlier. Jesus will return to the earth and reign with the saints for a thousand years. One of the main reasons why I believe that's true is because That's what the Bible says. One day, I was invited to a debate at a church. 
they decided to give over their evening service to have a debate. They had some kids, they weren't kids, they were young adults, they were going to Bible college and learning to be a millennial. And the pastor was worried and so he wanted to have a pre-mill versus a-mill debate. And he invited me to come along to represent the pre-mill view. I thought, this is going to be great. So I turned up there and I sat down at the front. They had some tables. They had one for me. And I sat there with my Bible. I was there early. These young adults, Bible college students, they came late. And so we were all there kind of waiting for them. And they walked in. They had trolleys like of books and they walked in and they came out the front and piled all these books. I'm glad that it wasn't being streamed because you wouldn't have been able to see them. They sat at their desk behind piles of books, commentaries on Revelation, all these theology books and they were ready to make their case about amillennialism. But the guy, the pastor who asked me to come, he rigged the whole thing, he let me speak first. And so I had to make the case, why did I believe that there was, that premillennialism was what it said? And so what I did was I read Revelation 21 to 10, just like I did for you, that talks about a thousand years and Jesus reigning on the earth for a thousand years. And I said, well, I read it, and then at the end I said, well, it says that Jesus is going to reign on the earth for a thousand years, and as far as I'm aware, 20 follows 19. 19 has when he comes, and then there's this thousand years when he reigns on the earth. I'm premillennial because that's what it says. And everyone in the church went, yes, yeah, that's what it says. And then everyone looked at them and why are you a millennial? Why don't you think that that is what it says? And off they went reading their books and they were embarrassed. They were embarrassed because that's what the Bible says. It's as simple as that. Next, the first resurrection and the second death. I think I better read this bit again. I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. You know who that is? Have you ever read the stories that Jesus talked about where it talks about his disciples being judges? I think that'll be us. Just putting that out there. I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who'd not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So we're talking about the resurrection of some dead people who died in the seven years. That's what that's talking about, right? The rest of the dead, that's all the other people, did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So we got a resurrection at the end, uh, at the beginning of the thousand years of everyone who died during the seven years. And now we're talking about a resurrection of everyone else at the end of the thousand years. Then it goes back and says, well, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are the ones who share in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they're going to be priests of God and of Christ and they'll reign with him for a thousand years. First resurrections and second deaths. I want you to get that the first, the word first in our minds sometimes talks about order, like sequence, the first in a sequence of resurrections. I want you to get that out of your head. It's talking about orders. It's talking about rank, types of resurrection. So mentioned here are those who've been martyred in the tribulation period. They're going to be raised and get new bodies and reign with Christ. I think those of us who are believers are going to be raised in a similar way. 
Here's some passages. Look, I read this passage and the next one at funerals because it talks about believers being raised from the dead and we may not be aware and in our sadness it's probably a bit hard to think of it but the coffins that we're putting the bodies in are one day going to be empty. Here's the passages. I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep or have died, that you may not grieve as others do, have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So there's going to be some people who are dead And there are people who haven't died, but the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So the ones who have died, they're going to rise, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's why we read it at funerals. The body we're putting into the coffin, it's going to be raised. (laughs) Hallelujah. Then there's this one. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We're not all going to die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body, body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And so here we have talk in the New Testament about the resurrection of believers, both living ones and the dead ones. I believe that is of the same order of resurrection as the first one in Revelation, that is the people who are believers, who became believers at the end of the seven-year period. I think it's obvious that it's clearly a different group of people. When are all of these resurrections going to take place? We know that one of them's going to be at the end of the seven years because it says this one in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in 1 Corinthians 15, it doesn't say when it is going to be. I, for one, accept that it's going to be prior to the seven years. At some point, prior to the seven years, because We're not talked about in those seven years much at all. And so I'm what's called a pre-tribulational, before the tribulation, we're going to get raised, pre-millennialist, two L's, two N's. So I want the rapture before the seven years and I've got Jesus coming back at the end and then he's reigning on the earth for a thousand years. Pre-trib, pre-mill. That's what I'm called. I think many of you probably are that. But you need to know that there's heaps of people that aren't. Heaps. There's heaps of people that are post-trib pre-mill. That's a trendy view. Perhaps the most trendy post-trib pre-mill. I think it's better to just go pre-pre and be ahead of the game. There's also lots of A-mills. They're teaching it in the Bible College in Bris Vegas. There's heaps of them. We shouldn't be 
taking these disagreements on board and going, oh, these people, they're bad and evil because they've got the wrong view. No, 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 no. These are Bible-believing, serious Christians. We're just disagreeing with them. That's okay. Are you getting my vibe? Yeah. You want to you wanna have a fight with an amillennialist? I have. I've had a public debate with them. It's no problem. It's not an issue. They're just wrong. <laughs> you know, I'm wrong. Have you ever been wrong? Ah. So <laughs> okay, men. This is the thing. If you're sitting next to your wife, has she ever been wrong? Now, wives and men, have, 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 has he ever been wrong? <laughs> we all know how to be wrong. We're wrong all the time. Just get used to it. It's not a problem. Not a problem. But you've got this, this, this debate about when all these resurrection happen. I'm happy to go pre trib pre mill um, Fine. If you don't want to go that way, that's fine too. Just learn to be wrong. You, you've got, though, all this stuff about resurrections and deaths and stuff. I just want to make that clear because it is hard to swallow. I've got a table and I've got a chart. Oh, same information in both. For the table-oriented heads, you can have a look at that. There's a first resurrection. There's being raised to glory. And there's a second resurrection. There's people who are raised to glory to judgment at the end of the thousand years. There's a first death, which is the death of everyone, like physical death. And then there's the second death, which is being thrown into the lake of fire. So there's two lots of resurrections. There's a resurrection of people who were believers. And then there's the second resurrection, the resurrection of people who are going to get judged. Then there's two types of death, a physical death and a second death which is thrown into the lake of fire. See how it's not about order or sequence? It's about rank. It's about types of resurrection and death. You getting all this? It's clear, it's clear, crystal. I'm looking at your faces going, I wonder if they're understanding. They're all going, yeah, it's clear. Look at this one. I love this one. Ooh. Oh, the colours haven't stood out very well. There's all different colours in there. So here we've got the first death. We're all going to have this, at all except if Jesus comes and there's a, well, the rapture happens. The passages in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, that's these people. If you're still alive when that happens, you get a transformed body in the blink of an eye and you get... Guernsey in the first resurrection and you don't actually ever suffer the first death who wants to go there and be in that group me but I doubt it wouldn't that be I don't know it could happen it could happen anytime but this is what happens people who die their bodies we put in coffins right well we do in the west and where does their soul go? Their soul goes to be with the Lord. All right, so the body's in the coffin out the front of the church. The, the soul is with the Lord. So this is what happens to them. Believers go with the Lord. Then at the rapture, when those people will join them, but the dead will rise first, and then they will participate in the millennium and in heaven, as we'll talk about in chapter 21, in the end. All right, so that's what happens to, well, you and me who are believers with the Lord, this is what happens to us. First death, first resurrection, boom, we're good. Is this clear? I love charts. Got all day. All right, let's talk about if you're a non believer, you don't go to be with the Lord, you go to a bad place called Hades your body is in the coffin just like the believers but your soul is not with the Lord you then participate in the second resurrection and are raised judge and sent into the second death 
the lake of fire. You got this? If you're not concerned for people who are unbelievers in this life, you've got a problem. I've put this word here, intermediate state, because when we have funerals, when we get all emotional, and so we should, sometimes we talk about heaven, and sometimes we worry about hell, but you need to get that there's this time when we're with the Lord or not with the Lord and our bodies aren't connected to us. But there will be a resurrection, the order of resurrection for believers and an order of resurrection for unbelievers. And then an eternal destiny awaits. All of that clear? What a relief. I have one point of application for us and then we're done. And that is about the thousand years, at the end of the thousand years, the devil is released for a little period of time. What's going on with that? Now I want you to think about this thousand year period and what it's gonna be like here. We've read some about lions and lambs and, and spears being turned into pruning hooks and so on. But understand that the earth has been largely decimated by the seven years of tribulation. Jesus returns and he reigns with those of the first resurrection. And they are reigning over those few survivors of the seven years who aren't believers. They're still there and they will start to populate the earth as the thousand years progresses. You've got some people who are resurrected on the earth and you've got some people who aren't resurrected who they're reigning over. These people are going to enjoy the earth as Jesus reigns. Jesus will be present and many generations will pass, and for a thousand years, Satan will be bound and unable to influence them. I would presume that during these days, everyone's gonna be happy to believe in Jesus. Why, if you don't believe in Jesus, if you don't think he's real, you can say, hey, let's go meet him. He's just over there, I think he'll be in Jerusalem. Just go there and join him up, meet him, or we'll be good. Is everything all right there? Got fingers stuck or something. I'm going to pause while we wait for a sec. Keep going, you're going to be right. You're just undoing the back of the pew. Good work. Let's keep going. Um, I don't know about you, but in my life, I often consider that the greatest difficulties that I have are caused by my environment. All right? I think that if I had more cash, my life would be better. I think if I had better health, then my life would be better. I think that if circumstances were different. If my husband hadn't a died, if my wife hadn't a died, if all of these bad things, if all of these circumstances were different, then my life would be better. 
Well, what you have here in the millennium is Jesus present. You've got perfect, perfect living environment, if you, if you will. That's what you've got. You've got peace. You've got justice. You've got Jesus physically present, reigning on the earth, bringing righteousness and all the rest. It's, it's absolute paradise. You've got all of that. And then yet, at the end of a thousand years, you let devil, the devil out. And in one minute flat, he's caused a whole lot of deception. And people will follow Satan at the drop of a hat, despite the perfect living conditions. And so what I learn from this little season, and I think that's why it's here, the little season exists so that we will be forced to face this issue afresh. That the fundamental problem of humanity, your fundamental problem and my fundamental problem is our sinfulness. It's not our poor environment. And so when you think what I need is a little bit more self-discipline. What I need is a little bit better time management. What I need is a little bit of this and a little bit of that. What I need is a bit of a different environment. If that's how you view yourself, if that's how you see your spiritual life in particular, you are sadly mistaken. Your fundamental problem is your sinfulness. And you and I need a saviour not a better environment. You got that? That's the lesson for today. I'm done. Oh, let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, for the truth of it. It's heavy stuff we've been talking about. And we pray that you would help us to digest it and to see that we need you. Lord, we pray for this pew, that it will come apart and a little life will be released. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oi. Okay, let's stand and sing our final song. Well done to the gentleman who's released little girl who had her head stuck in the chair. <laughs> oh dear. That's a story to tell forever, isn't it? <laughs> Raining sunlight.
pray. Lord, we thank you that you have the future sorted. You have a great plan for peace on this earth, and you have sent a great savior for us whose fundamental problem is our sin. Help us to rest in him and to know his fullness this week, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Goodbye to everyone in the room and online.